you know, when they, when they're coming to the end of their life, no one's looking back on their life and saying, you know, I wish I would have worked more hours. I wish I would have put more time in the office. I wish I would have skipped more vacations and, you know, really hustled for that next promotion. Those things are never on anyone's regret list. It's almost always, I wish I would have spent more time with my kids. I wish I would have done more family experiences. And and the challenge that everyone has, and this is why it's difficult, is um, we are bent towards tomorrow and then the next day. And, you know, something as obscure as 10 years from now, it's really hard for us to do that time discounting. And so like, you know, we think, oh, we'll do it tomorrow or we'll get to it. But then we never do because the, the tyranny of the present is so strong. really look forward to diving into that with you because it, the the tech side of business is really interesting and you're you're diving headlong into that you know youtube channel you're creating content all the time and you're a certified financial planner and you have i don't know how many uh, designations you have but you have like all of them i have four <laughs> i'm actually working on a fifth right now and that that's amazing. It's like lifelong learner. Good for you that you're doing all that stuff. Um, I'm sure there's value yeah. in your business to that. But I've got Michael Baker here with me. Really excited about this conversation. He and I have talked on the radio before. Got connected through a mutual college buddy of mine. And now he's this guy I rely on for information on the market. And so glad to have Michael here. And so, Michael, thanks for joining me. I'm very happy to be here. Thanks for having me on. So tell me about your certifications real quick. Tell me the story behind getting all those certifications and how they benefit your clients. Right. So uh, right now, I, I think I just said I, I have four professional designations um, and I'm, I'm, I'm currently low key working on a fifth. Um, but, you know, the, the most the most uh, popular one or the one that would probably resonate most with the listeners that you have is a certified financial planner. Uh, that was one of the first, that was actually my first designation that I got. And basically I, I, I kind of felt like that was the gold standard uh, for financial planning and, you know, having a fiduciary duty to clients. And I felt like if I wanted to work with any, pretty much anybody in a financial advice giving, you know, type of role, uh, I needed to have that type of credential, you know, behind me. I feel that's pretty much, I feel like that that's should be the minimum requirement now for people working with a financial planner. I know that there might be some people that disagree, but yeah, so I got, I got the CFP a uh, long time ago and been, I've, I've been a card carrying member ever since. Very proud of that. And, uh, and then over time, as I've just wanted to kind of differentiate some of the practice, uh, some parts of the practice, I've I've pursued some other designations. Uh, so I have a couple of designations, uh, the the RICP and the RMA, that are specialty designations for helping people with retirement income planning. Um, pretty deep dive. Uh, I know that just about all the marketing with financial firms right now, they say everybody pretty much does retirement planning, but uh, there's there's retirement planning in air quotes, and then there are people that have really studied. Uh, the academic literature and the research and have, have taken deep dives into actually how to construct retirement income solutions. And and so those are two designations that, uh, that are a part of that. And then I have the SEMA, which is, uh, which is an investment management um, designation that I got because I wanted to work with, we have a team of CFAs, which is a charter financial analyst. We have a team of CFAs that we work with that manage uh, the portfolios for our clients. And I wanted just to be able to bridge the gap better between analyst speak and everyday client speak. So I wanted to be able to, you know, better understand, you know, how our analysts think and operate when they're looking at portfolio construction and have a vocabulary that worked when speaking with them. And then also be able to take that knowledge and and translate it down to my everyday clients because, um, there are some CFAs who are phenomenal in, in dealing with clients. And then some of them are very, they're so smart that they just have a hard time, like talking to us dumbs, you know? <laughs> so I like to stand in the gap and, and that's why I did that. 
<laughs> yeah. And how do you, how do you even get to CFP and all of your designations? Because at some point you were a model <laughs> looking at your career. Oh man. Yeah. You've had, you, you've had quite the arc. So yeah, we're taking it way back then, aren't we, Travis? Uh, so my, I, I refer to that affectionately as my former life. Um, my former life, uh, I worked as a, I was a model and I worked in film and television. I did that, um, pretty much after, after I graduated from Presbyterian shout out to uh, PC. Um, when I graduated from Presbyterian college, I see that on your, I see that, um, when I graduated, uh, I moved to New York and probably for the next, I don't know, almost eight, eight and a half years. Uh, that's what I did. I worked, I lived in New York. I lived in Los Angeles, spent some time in Milan, Italy, spent some time in Miami. And uh, that's what I tried to work in that industry. And um, about the time that I was around 28 years old, I was just felt like it was time for Peter Pan to grow up and get a real job. And so uh, I came home and basically started over. And that was kind of the, the origin story. Um, I needed a job and I got a job in the insurance business. Um, cause if you know much about insurance, generally speaking, insurance is almost always hiring because they need sales representatives. And, uh, so I got a job doing that and, um, through networking, I met a, I, I met a guy who's a friend of mine, still a friend of mine to this day, but he and some other gentlemen were starting an advisory firm in Charlotte. And I was invited to come on board and be part of the, the team. And, um, as we, through the formation of that business, I was exposed to the advising side, the financial planning side of the business. And that's something that I just actually fell in love with right out of the gate. And so that's how I kind of got my start as a financial advisor. Nice. Are there anything you, yeah. miss, anything you miss about being a model? Not a thing. <laughs> <laughs> Not a <laughs> thing, man. I just had to grow up and then they're like, oh, I miss it so much. But that's a unique, that's got to be quite a grind. That I, well, I'll put like this. I, I, I made some great friends. Uh, obviously, I don't get to see those folks uh, hardly ever because they, they live all over the place. And you know, there's some people that, that I would love to connect with and, and be able to see from time to time. But it's, it's really difficult. But as far as being involved in that business, that industry, not missing it one, one bit. I can only fathom. And you know, that kind of leads us into a little bit the, the faith journey you had. Um, I don't know how much yeah. that relates to where you're at today, uh, but you know, tell me a little bit about your faith journey and how that correlates with your professions in the past, modeling, financial advising, where you're at today. Yeah, no, it's a great question. Um, so my faith journey, faith journey is, is uh, I don't want to say standard because that presupposes a lot about everybody, but uh, I grew up. Um, in, in South Carolina, which is the Bible Belt. So I grew up in church for the most part. And my parents, both of my parents um, took me to church every Sunday. Um, we were there for the weekday church activities. So I was very frequently involved in church. Um, I made a faith decision early on uh, when I was uh, six years old, when I, I made my initial like um, faith decision uh, to put my faith in Jesus Christ. And, you know, like I said, I grew up through church all through um, high school. My story is pretty common, I think, in that, you know, when I got into college, um, I was an athlete in college, too. Uh, when I got into college, I, I fell away from going to church frequently. Uh, I, I rarely went to church. I would go to church when I would go home to visit my family. But when I was away at school, and it was kind of on me to go to church and, you know, and basically be active in that, in that aspect of my life. I was not doing that. And I think my, my, the way I was living kind of reflected that, you know, I started to fall away, started to make some not so great decisions. Uh, and uh, that's one of the, I would say the lies of the world is we oftentimes tend to say, Oh, you know what? We, we compare ourselves to other people and, and that's how we judge whether or not we're, we're living right or, or we're quote unquote, a good person. And so in my mind, I would look at people who are really bad, <laughs> you know, and I would say, well, I'm not doing that stuff, so I'm good. 
I kind of fell away from going to church and, and, and really having my faith being a, a, a prominent part of my life for several years. And it wasn't until I was in Los Angeles, I was living in LA and, um, I, this, this is just the story as it is. Um, I was in a relationship with a, with a young woman and I remember she asked me if I was a Christian point blank. She was like, Hey, are you, are you a Christian? And I kind of looked at her like, duh. I mean, of course I am. But the, the thing that really jumped out at me was, wow, like there's no fruit. Like she can't see anything about me that points to Christ, nothing. So she had to ask. And that was a real wake up call for me. Uh, so at that point I started getting back into church and I was very fortunate. I found a phenomenal church in Los Angeles, California. So I got plugged back in and I'll be honest, Travis, like that was a huge turning point for my life because I feel like getting plugged back into the Lord, getting plugged back into church and, and really kind of reigniting, um, that part of me. It opened up some doors, but it also began to grease the wheels for my exit from that business. And uh, one of one of the prayers that I prayed was, you know, I, I prayed, you know, Lord, if this isn't what you want for me, then just take the desire away. I said, I don't want to want this if it's not in your will. And um, to this day, like you asked me just a moment ago, do I miss anything? I do not. I don't have any regrets. I don't miss like, I, I don't think like in my head, like, oh man, if I just stayed one more, two, one more year, two more years, I would have had my big break. I don't, I'm so thankful that I got out when I did. I'm so thankful that I met my wife when I did. And, you know, everything else has been fantastic as far as uh, life goes. That's great. And how, so now, how does that, you work in money. So how does that faith play itself out? as you manage money and deal with retirement plans and really serving others, I mean, it always plays out in anything that we do. Faith plays out, but right. for yeah, you, um, money, money sphere, what does that look like? Well, I think, I think worldview matters immensely. Um, in, in this day and age, well, there are a lot of people that when they come into the, when they come into the office, everybody's bringing in stuff with them. They're bringing in their money history. They're bringing in their psychology. They're bringing in their biases, their values. Um, and, and a lot of times people are also bringing in their worldview. Mm-hmm. And um, but we have a lot of clients that come in that openly profess to be believers. And there are some, pe- some clients that are more understated on their faith. And then there are some clients that I, I don't believe are believers. And in each and every circumstance, I feel like, part of my job is to, as the Bible says, do everything as you would, like you're working for the Lord. And so like we try to bring excellence to each and every household that we serve and, and, uh, the worldview that we have like colors our advice. You know, we try to give wisdom, what I would call biblically wise counsel to everyone. Um, you know, and so it's, it's rare. I don't think there's anything that we discuss that if we had to distill it down, we couldn't go right back to the Bible and say, Hey, this is actually, this is a principle that we pull straight out of like the word, you know, um, we don't get preachy on, on, on folks. And that's how that's shaped a lot of my view on certain things. And then when people are wanting me to weigh in and give them my thoughts or perspective on certain things, especially when they're trying to weigh out decisions, uh, that, that has shaped a lot of the way that I counsel folks. Who do you love to serve when you so get somebody walking in through the door in your in your profession? What yeah. really gets you excited? Well, the framing of that question is rough because who gets you excited? Because then if I say somebody and and that's not them, they think, oh man, he wouldn't be excited to talk to me. Uh, me. I love. Here's the I truth: clients are like, hey, I'm beating down the door to listen to <laughs> Travis Fitzwater's podcast, but here we go. <laughs> hey, man. Maybe listen, when it, when it, when it goes on the internet, Travis, it lives forever. Yeah, that's right. Um, it lives forever. Um, so here, here's the way I would answer that. I, I would love, truly would love to help everybody. 
Uh, the facts are, though, not everybody wants to be helped, number one. Uh, I've learned that in this business. Uh, there are a lot of people that will raise their hand and say, oh, help me, pick me. But then when you throw the life preserver out, they do not reach for it. Um, it's one of life's great conundrums. I've never figured it out, and I stopped trying to several years ago. But um, there are a lot of folks that um, we're limited. I'm, I'm, I have the same number of hours in my day that everybody else does. Um, so we have to be somewhat selective with who we can work with. And most of that is trying to choose relationships where we can really add value. Um, and I feel like uh, for those for those households, um, those are people that are, you know, planning for, you know, I, I said planning for retirement. That's a that's one where we've done a lot of work in both my business partner and I, we kind of grew up in the business of learning how to help people plan and prepare for retirement. So we've got a lot of clients, people that we work with in that pre-retiree you know, 50 years old and, and, and older cohort. Um, we have a lot of families now that we're transitioning to retirement. Uh, I'll give you two areas, Travis. One area that is, has been on my heart for a couple of years, and I finally have just decided to do something about it instead of just thinking, you know, having it exist in my brain and in the ether, was uh, with widows. We have every year probably two, maybe three um, ladies who lose a spouse very suddenly. And all of a sudden they're kind of the non CFO spouse and they're immediately having to make all of their financial decisions for the, I say for the rest of their life, but truly like they're suddenly having to make all of these major decisions that they either were not making beforehand or were not making by themselves beforehand. And in many cases, there's there's large sums of money coming in the form of life insurance or 401k assets that are now their assets. And you compound the financial stress with the emotional stress of losing a spouse. It can be overwhelming. And a lot of these ladies just don't know what to do. And, and it's stressful. And so we have started creating specific area of our practice that's going to be dedicated to helping widows, helping widows, like make sure that they are informed about their financial life, that they have support, that there's a team of professionals that, that have been vetted, that if they need help in, you know, any specific area, we have resources for them, um, all the way down to things like a handyman, somebody that we know is trustworthy, that could help them with things around the house. Um, we're, we're dedicating a, an area of our practice to helping widows. Um, I think there's a biblical verse uh, in there too that points to that, and, uh, taking care of widows and orphans. But um, and then the other area is what I would call um, people that are in our peer group. You know, uh, Generation X uh, business owners, you know, high earning households, people like that are out there hustling. They're trying to grow a business, build their wealth, raise a family, going through a lot of the same things that um you and I are, are are also going through but you know are feeling like they don't know who they can talk to and you know the advisor that might be working with their parents is their parents age or the you know that the advisor that was helping their parents is about to retire um so those high earner high earner business owner households uh that are you know gen x um we're we're looking to help those people out as well what are you seeing? This is kind of bouncing all over the place, so forgive me, but we have this epidemic of loneliness. And I think people mm. are grinding out careers, grinding out a living, maybe prioritizing that over their families, which I think our generation has been taught by our parents who came from, came from families that had nothing. And therefore, their identity was in their stuff. Like, are there moments where you get to tell people, hey, you don't get to live forever. You can plan as much as you want, but at some point you need to enjoy what you have. Is, is there anything in, the, that's in our a, generation yeah, that's where, a, where, you, where you encourage people to say, hey, you're, you're working really hard. You've done a lot, but like your family needs you. Your kids, mm -hmm. you, you need to be present. You're missing it. You're missing out. There's a great question that um, I will ask some of these folks, and it's not my question. It's a question that, um, you know, I got from 
Ron Blue and uh, Kingdom Advisors, but it's a great question. And the question is, is, is how much is enough? You know, um, because a lot of times we get, we can be susceptible to this idea of, you know, more is better. The more I have, the more I accumulate, the better I'm doing. The challenge with that is, it's, it's called a, you know, hedonic treadmill as, you know, as, as we do better, the, the goalpost moves again. And then, you know, where we thought, oh, I'll be happy once I get to X. Well, then we get X and then we realize, oh, you know what? I'll just be happy. I'll be happy and I'll relax and I'll, and I'll put, you know, put on the brakes when I get to Y, but then we get to Y and now we're looking ahead at Z. And, um, especially what I would say to anyone that has kids, you only get them for so long and you, no matter how hard you try, you can't back, you cannot buy back, um, the years that, that we lose. And that doesn't mean we've made a, a, an error that can never be rectified and relationships can't be restored. Cause I believe they can. My son, he just turned seven and he will only be seven once. And then that's it. My daughter is 10 and she's 10 once. And so I only get these time, this time with him is very finite. And so one of the, one of the things, one of the principles that we try to help people understand is you can get more money. You can make more money. You can invest and earn more money on your investments. You'll never be able to buy back time. You'll never be able to do that. And so we want people to stop and, and invest in things like experiences Invest in memories, invest in experiences with your kids, because those are the things that are timeless. And those are the things that go with us all through life. And so that is definitely something that we try to instill in people, because, I mean, you, you can be um, you can be going along and everything is fine. And then life can change immediately, um, suddenly, as I just shared with you about like my widows. Uh, so like. You cannot neglect today. Today is important. It's so hard when you're fighting for your family. You're fighting for your young family. You're doing the best you can. You're trying to make a living for yourself and for have the opportunity to do some experiences and thinking about the future and taking care of your family, but at the same time, realizing that time is fleeting. I saw this thing the other day. It's some statistic that said something down the lines of, by the time our kids are 18, we've spent 90% of the time we've, we will have, we'll ever spend with them 90%. So like the first yeah. eight years of their life, like that's the time you have with them. And then it's done, not done, but you have 10% left. And I think this is where people really struggle when they realize, oh no, my kid, you know, I'm not around my kids anymore uh, ever. And right. You know, very little loneliness. I can only fathom and the people that have spent their career really focused on accumulation. I think the regret has to be deep and really strong when they've missed it. Do you experience that a lot? Well, I can tell you, um, you know, a lot of the research when they, when they, when they survey people who are, you know, at or near the end of life, um, very few, I, no one is saying, you know, when they, when they're coming to the end of their life, no one's looking back on their life and saying, you know, I wish I would have worked more hours. I yeah. wish I would have put more time in the office. I wish I would have skipped more vacations and, you know, really hustled for that next promotion. That's those, those things are never on anyone's like regret list. It's almost always, I wish I would have spent more time with my kids. Like, I wish I would have done more family experiences. And, and the challenge that everyone has, and this is why it's difficult, is it's, we have, um, we are bent towards tomorrow and then the next day. And, you know, something as obscure as 10 years from now. 15 years from now, 20 years from now, it, it's really hard for us to do that time discounting. And so we think, oh, we'll do it tomorrow or we'll get to it. But then we never do because the, the tyranny of the present is so strong. And so like, that's why we keep going on this, the same pattern that we do. And, and, and unfortunately, 
sometimes it takes like a pattern interrupt for us to like get off of that. But in working with people with money, so to put it into financial terms, uh, the person who's making $300,000 a year, their, their life is not significantly different or exponentially better than the person who's making $225,000 a year. There's definitely leaps with income and there's definitely things that having more income can make certain things easier, but everybody's got problems. Everybody's got stress. Everybody's got the same 24 hours in a day with what matters. And I think where the, the richness in life comes in is how you handle your priorities. And, and, and that's the big thing that I worry that a lot of people are going to miss out on because we are, I believe this, like from a faith perspective, I believe we're wired for relationships with other people. And obviously the, the core unit of that is the nuclear family. And so I believe when we have kids, we're supposed to steward them and shape them. And we can't neglect that responsibility. Yes, we're, we're all busy, but we got to figure it out. And it's, it's tough. It's yeah. definitely tough. Yeah, I agree. I'm, I'm sure I'm older than you, but they're similar age kids. And we just have this window. We've got to take advantage of the window or it's just gone. And and you don't have the ability to have that relationship with your kids. And I just have so many friends now like that are my age, same same ages that are grinding away at and having success in the marketplace, but I just know they're going to get to the end of it and say, I, even now we're having conversations with my friends that are like, I'm missing it with my kids. And it's really hard to adapt on the fly. You don't just get to sell your rental properties overnight. You don't get to unwind all businesses, multiple businesses and mm -hmm. shit right away. Some people have the gumption to do it and they do it. Some people go out and they sell everything. And they're like, all right, we're going to live out of a, a bus for a year and go RV the country or whatever. That is like yeah. a small, small percentage of people. But it just breaks my heart when people aren't thinking from that perspective because I just think there's so much life to live right now. And I, for some reason, our society has just really kind of said, you need to work really hard for 40, 50 years, have a retirement. And there's a lot of intelligence in this. By the way, it's not like I'm not painting with a, with a broad brush. This is a bad idea that you shouldn't plan for your future and you shouldn't do the best you can to, to have a retirement at the end of your career. But if that's all that there is and your, your life, like 40 years of life just passes you by and you hadn't had the gumption to go live a little bit while you were young and while you could move around, while you could get around, that just blows me, blows me away. And I think our society has got it wrong and I think it's doing damage. I, I think that is a very much a cultural thing but it's also one of the things that I, I tell people because i i'll speak at church churches a lot and do financial workshops for churches and for me like, one of the things i always try to bring home to everyone is retirement as we understand it is not a biblical concept you won't see that what you just described anywhere in the bible so, you know, there's, there's Abe out there working his field. And then once he had, you know, stored up enough grain, you know, he was done and never to, never to work in the field again. Yeah. Um, what we understand as this, you know, what I would say modern day society is relatively new and it's a byproduct of how wealthy our nation has become, you know, that we, that you actually can, you know, work and have up enough savings. And, you know, there's a few social safety nets in there, social security, we have uh, Medicare where people can, you know, have um, medical needs taken care of. So this idea, that's that's kind of new. And um, not that it's bad, it's just new. And so since it's something that's not been around forever or for ages, you know, people are getting their perspectives a little bit skewed, I think, on, you know, what they need to do. Um, I love when clients tell me, Hey, what do you want to do? And they're like, Hey, we, we just want to, we want to spend time with our kids, go on trips with our grandkids. We've already done our traveling. We've already done our fun stuff because I know like they did, they did take the opportunities to go on trips and do things and that that's a key value for them. Uh, so, and, and the other thing too, this wasn't mentioned, but it's, I think it's worth mentioning 
one of the things that we we just as a society i just have come to believe more and more we're just so unhealthy not to go into the covid whole thing but i think if covid that covid pandemic experience did not wake people up to realize just how unhealthy we are as americans that you need here's your wake up call like we are unhealthy we have terrible food habits we have terrible exercise habits so this idea that if you're going to grind and grind and grind and grind and not experience life now and not do things now, and then you're going to do them in 40 years, you might not be able to physically. You may not physically be able to do all of the things that you're thinking about. Something may happen. And I, I don't, I'm not speaking that over anyone's life, but that's what I'm telling people is like, you know, if you want to do something now, like focus on getting healthy, focus on being outside, focus on going and doing things with your loved ones now and and make that part of your life journey for the next 20 or 30 years. You're not allowed to talk about being unhealthy in 2023. It feels like you're going to, you're going to get my whole podcast canceled because you're saying we need to be better about our health. But I, I agree with you that we're just in this odd spot, especially post COVID where you couldn't even really talk about what was what was going to help you get through COVID? It wasn't the masking and the, the vaccines. Those things, I think, help in some form or fashion. Maybe, maybe they don't. I don't know. Right. But being not overweight helped a ton based on data. Um, getting some outside time, vitamin C, the things sure. that are good for our body that we just don't do today because we're inside working at computers, sitting all day. There's just need for movement and there's need for um, the, a healthy discussion on what is a good life to live. And I think that's not being sick all the time throughout your whole life. And that requires making hard decisions on what you're eating and how you're living your life. It's really, really interesting. And it feels like it's almost been shameful to even discuss these things, to discuss that we're a nation of that's, that's lost control over its diet and has no self-control, really over various aspects of our lives, not just health. Oh, I agree. And I, you know, I think, um, you know, to, so I, I the, I'll bring it to an area where I can speak from a position of, uh, of expertise because I'm not a medical for doc, medical doctor, but um, every year fidelity does a study That's advice um, or medical about the, so the everybody knows. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, not medical advice. Yeah. Everyone chill the attorneys out. Um, but uh, every year, Fidelity will do a study about um, the cost of health care uh, in retirement and what, what a 65-year-old couple should anticipate spending for out-of-pocket medical expenses. And I believe, I know it's north of $300,000. Um, I believe the, the number is around $360,000 that uh, a, an average 65-year-old couple should expect to spend for out-of-pocket health care costs. And we're not, that's not talking about long-term care, Travis. That's just your everyday going to doctor, needing medications, needing, needing, um, things to help you, um, healthcare expense wise. And so to me, I'm like, look, let's put down payments on that now by trying to get healthy habits, live a healthy lifestyle. So we're not relying on the pharmaceutical industry we're not lying on the medical, you know, apparatus of all the different doctors and treatments and things because it's incredibly difficult to get off of that carousel once you get on. Yeah. So true. Man, we we took we that's a 35 minute intro. I, I love it and finding out more about your expertise. But I really want to get into market technology. Heck yeah, man, let's do it. Let's keep going. Let's go into the next chapter. The market, you're an expert in this space. You do wraparound services, I assume, as a, C a CFP. You're doing not just like, hey, I can help you with your investments, but you're doing retirement planning. You're doing probably tax planning. Uh, you do the whole gamut, I assume, under a CFP designation. So what what are you telling? Where do you see it going in the market and where we're at? We're in a unique time right now where a ton of money was f thrown into the market. Now that's contracting a little bit for inflationary reasons. Where are we at? Yeah, it's, you know, this is the, this is the million dollar question. The, the challenge with it is, is that, um, there's so most market forecasts are almost always wrong. In fact, uh, there was somebody, I cannot remember the person's name, 
but I was just listening to an interview um, two days ago where they were talking about this gentleman who um, he's a, a major analyst for um, a pretty large, a pretty large warehouse where he basically like nailed the bear market of 2021. He called, um, excuse me, 2022. He like nailed it and was, he looked like the smartest man on wall street. And then he doubled down again for his forecast in for this year. And he's been horribly wrong, horribly wrong. And it is so incredibly difficult to forecast what's going to happen in the short term. Uh, already we've started this next um, election cycle with uh, the presidential candidates on both sides. What I would tell investors is the key thing that any investor needs to understand is what are, what is the, the actual, what is your actual time frame for your investments? So if you, if you've got a very short term focus, um, it's a great time right now for short term money because, um, Right now, the the new as we record this today, I think the new CPI numbers came out. Um, there'll be always people that don't believe those numbers, but you know the CPI numbers came out. They were under four. I think it was three point three point six. Yeah. Um, and and so you know if you're if you know inflation is now running at an annualized rate of uh, you know between three and four percent, and you can get um, you know, CDs paying over four or five percent like right now, there's real rate of return on pretty stable, safe money. Uh, as a, a longer term investor, I'm still a believer in equities. I think you need to be careful. We've learned from the past that sometimes people get a little bit overzealous with how much of their portfolio they want to expose to stocks or even very volatile stocks because they're looking for outsized return. But I think that equities are, are still positioned to, to do well over the long term. Now, there are people that disagree with that. But um, the reason I have that view is if you're not going to put the money in equities, then where are you going to put it? Because to me, the United States is still, we are all in the dirty laundry bin globally. So I will concede that point. We're all in the dirty laundry basket, but I think we're the cleanest shirt in the dirty laundry basket. Um, but where I would tell people to focus on, and you know, especially in this next upcoming election cycle, there's going to be several things that are on the table for open discussion. One is going to be the role of government in providing uh, benefits and transfer payments to anyone and everyone. Because one of the largest line items when you consolidate all of these um, programs that we have to provide assistance and benefits um, to anyone and everyone, it is a tremendous, tremendous number, Travis. And um, we're already borrowing our borrowing borrowing to live um and i just don't think that that trajectory is sustainable so we got to have a real conversation about that we're going to be talking about the future of social security and medicare um because there's going to have to be reforms done within the next uh 5 to 10 years um unless just something miraculous happens with the math that i don't foresee coming and then the last piece is is going to be taxes, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that uh, Donald Trump passed, uh, and, or Donald Trump's administration they passed while he was in office, that expires in 2025, and uh, so we would go back to an old tax code, um, which would presumably have some inflation adjustments for it. Could be some significant inflation adjustments because of what we've lived through, but. Um, you know, I, I definitely think that there's a conversation to be had about, you know, the role of taxes and, and how much is too much and is the government spending tax dollars wisely. Um, so there's a lot on the table for people to be paying attention to in the next short in the short run. But I would still say long run, um, no other country, no other geographic region is showing more strength in my view, than the United States. So I'm still a long-term bullish on uh, what the U.S. markets can do for us. That's really encouraging. It's encouraging to hear. And uh, I, I don't necessarily disagree. I still think we're the, the greatest country, the greatest investment. So many countries rely on us. And when we went down around COVID, we were buffered against the, the international economy because we're the greatest economy in the in the world <clears throat> so Correct. europe struggled harder you know asian markets struggled harder the dollar did a little bit better 
even though we were spending like crazy, but everybody was around that time. So inflation hit everybody because there's so much money in the market. The debt is a real concern. I'm with you on that. And DC, I just think is a mess. And it's like, can you get yes, it is to sit in a room together and decide on the future of our country that's best for our kids, which isn't continual debt increases. So it's like figuring out spending. That's where the real problem is. And we just don't have the gumption to have that conversation. It doesn't feel like. Yeah, we won't dive too deeply into politics yeah. unless you wish to. Oh, no, I, <laughs> try not. I think that the, we've lost the ability to have, uh, have serious conversations uh, about hard things, principled, philosophical discussions. It's become reality TV and, you know, team red, team blue. And a lot of people have fallen for that um, hook, line and sinker. And so like to, to kind of put a bow on what you asked me about markets and investors um, this year um, has, despite several things that we've seen so far headline wise, there was the, the noise about, are we going to have bank failures? There was a noise about the dollar crisis. Um, you know, there was the the war in Russia and Ukraine. And um, most people, if you've been investing in, um, you know, in equities, their portfolios have been having a pretty good year, I would imagine. And it, you would never think that from what you see on the news every day. And so mm -hmm. I would encourage everyone, like one of the best things you can do for your, for your, your own sanity and, and peace of mind is to turn off the cable news um, commentary, you know, um, if something important happens, like, you know, you, you can read about it, but like the, the commentary that we get day to day on the financial media channels and on the, and on the cable news channels, I don't think adds any value to most people's lives. Do, it reminds me to ask you, do you have a recommended investment strategy? That's like anti Kramer. <laughs> Cause that guy's wrong. <laughs> the anti I have seen like, that on, on Twitter, the inverse Kramer ETF. It's always funny. Um, I think your people just have to understand, you know, Jim Kramer is an incredibly smart guy and people like him. He has such a difficult job. You see, because we have gone to, and we were talking about this a little bit um, at the very beginning. We've, we've gone to this place where, People want 24-7 information feeds about just about anything. You pick up your smartphone and there's constant podcasts. So you can pick whatever topic you want and you can listen to podcasts about it. The, the news media, it's a 24-7 news cycle. Well, financial media, they've got 24 hours a day that they're trying to fill the air with content. And so folks like Kramer and the people that are constantly in, in this prominent space, they got to come up with stuff to say all the time. And then we beat up on them for being wrong. The fact is, is that probably the best investment show on, our, on we would ever have would have like one episode a month where someone would come in and they would give everybody straight fire commentary for 60 minutes and then it would turn off and then we wouldn't get anything again for like another month. But no one would ever watch that show in today's age because it's like, oh, I don't get enough. I don't I need something. And it's like we're all like heroin addicts for this information. It really and truly doesn't serve us. I was really looking for a stronger anti-Kramer type sentiment there. But <laughs> <laughs> the yeah. that I've, I've heard go to bat for Jim Kramer in, in quite a while, but uh, I, I can't imagine that job being easy either on a day-to-day -day basis for trying to predict what's going to go up and what's going to go down. And I, I, I wouldn't envy that job. I'm sure. I mean, I know people would envy his paycheck, but I would not envy that role at all because, you know, it's just like, you know, he's there for, I mean, I, I, I use this word edutainment, right? He's exactly. there for, that's what it is. You know, he's all entertainment. That is, that is for dang sure. Well, let's, let's, so tell me a little bit about technology. What are you doing? You're, you're trying to get into a unique space where you're talking more on media sites about what you're doing. How's that going? And I love media. I think every brand ought to be thinking about how they're using media to get their message across. And you're in right. financial planning and you're doing it. 
So tell me about that and where you're finding success and where you're a little bit like this may not work as well. I've, I've, we've been with our office, we've been experimenting with, with all different types of, of media. My business partner and I, we, we had a podcast for um, several years and everyone's like, have a podcast, have a podcast. And I always felt like we do have a podcast, but nobody listens to it. <laughs> you know, um, but what's that? I've been telling people you got to have a podcast and now you're killing me. There's like, well, your guy just said on the podcast. No. Yes. If nobody's listening to it, but the, well, what we did though, and this, and so this is, so I want to, I want to talk about two things. One is like, if, if you're going to be a creator, right, if you're going to be a creator of content, you have to understand that that's a journey. You know, nobody gets to like turn on the power switch, turn on the microphone. And then two months later, you're Joe Rogan. That's not how it works. Like everybody that thinks Joe Rogan is cool, here's a newsflash. All of us that watch UFC knew Joe Rogan was cool before you did because Joe Rogan was commentating fights when no one was watching them. And we were all like, man, Joe Rogan is freaking awesome. Like we didn't know he did, did more things than just the fear factor guy. And now people have been exposed to him being like this intelligent person who likes to hear different viewpoints and ask qu yeah. questions. And he does long form interviews very well. And they're like, oh my gosh, Joe Rogan. But you have to start somewhere and you have to understand sometimes you try something, it doesn't work. You don't quit. You just retool and throw another line in the water. And so when I said we had a podcast, we did. Um, we love doing it. We love doing it. It wasn't getting the traction that we wanted to see. Um, so we took a break and we're getting ready to probably launch another iteration of that podcast uh, pretty soon. Uh, we're working on the details for that now. Uh, in the meantime, I feel like I resonate more um, as video, as a medium. And so I have started a, a YouTube channel. Um, and so a lot of my creative energy has been going into getting that up and running. But in, even that is something that like I continue to experiment with and see I'm trying to find my voice. So if you are a creator, if you're somebody who has a business and you have a brand, work with people that can help you, give you guidance and give you insights. But understand, when you get into this content creation space, you need to find your authentic voice. And that takes time. That takes time to do that. And so um, you can't pump fake your way, to use a basketball analogy, you can't pump fake your way into doing that. You have to do the reps. You have to do the shows. You have to record. You have to be willing to put stuff out there that nobody listens to. It's probably not going to be that good in the beginning anyway. And that's okay because that's the journey that we all must go on. And so, um, you know, that's that's what I'm still doing myself. You know, I haven't got it figured out, but I'm working on it. And so, you know, I use YouTube. Um, you know, we're getting a podcast up and running. And there, I'm sure there'll be something else in the future that we'll, we'll experiment with. But that's kind of where most of my energy is going right now is on YouTube. What are you seeing on, on an, the analytics side? What are you seeing that you're excited about some signal back from investing in those things? Well, you know what's interesting, and this is what I've told um, you know some of the people that I'm working with is that you know my channel is not breaking any records when it comes to views. Um, but what I find is is like when I repurpose my videos and when I share them, um, almost inevitably we get some traction. There'll be there'll be some people that reach out and they'll say, "Hey, love this last video." They'll say, "Hey, um, I need to come and speak with you about this," or "Hey, I just sent this video to my friend." And, and that's what I see. It's like, you know, little brick, you know, brick by brick, you know, building this small community of people that enjoy the content and are wanting to share it. And it's engaging people in a way that, you know, that they'll resonate with me. Right. You know, so like I'm one person who I have my voice that's going to be distinctly mine. And there's going to be people that are for me and for our community. And, and that's great. And then there's like Travis with you and, and what you're building with your company. There's going to be people that are going to be distinctly for Travis. They're going to love everything you do. And our goal is to just find, let's find as many of those people as we can and not lament anyone who just says, Hey, not for me. Cause it may not, it just may be, Hey, you're not for me today, but in two years you will be. So, 
um, that's what makes me excited is just seeing like the, the progress that we are making as a team and putting out our content. Cause we've come so far from where we were a year ago. What platforms are you excited about? Man, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty boring when it comes to that. Um, I think TikTok is worthless, but that's the, but that's pretty much because I, like, I, I get on, I get on, huh? Sorry. I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead. No, it's, is I just say, I think it's worthless because I mean, it, the reach on TikTok is absolutely insane. So don't listen to me if you're a creator uh, and think I'm down on TikTok. I'm down on TikTok because the 99% of the people on there talking about money are absolutely clueless. And I wouldn't trust them to give me $5 and change, but they have somehow have thousands and thousands of followers on, on TikTok. Um, but, uh, the reach on TikTok is amazing. I still like YouTube. Um, I like the, how it inter interacts with Google for search. I think there's still a ton of potential there. Um, and I think the flexibility that YouTube pri provides people, because with YouTube, to me, you can do short form videos, you could do long form videos, you can do um, full blown shows on YouTube. Um, so I think there's a, a ton of flexibility that has that. And then, of course, I feel like you can, um, if you can speak into a camera as though you're speaking to your friend or your a, a business associate or a client there's a transferability that takes place um, with video content that is to me supersedes anything else. Um, and so anything that's video driven, I think is, I think is huge and, and will be with us for a long time. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with that. I've, I've been very reluctant on TikTok. I think for a variety of reasons, the privacy concerns, just the feeling like the CCP has information being yes. worried about privacy, our privacy in 2023 is probably insane in and of itself because just the amount of information that we are willing to give away through social media apps uh, is is phenomenal. But TikTok in particular, I don't know why arm's length, keep it, keep yeah, it arm's length. understandable mindset. And, and I'm starting a media company where I'm trying to take in long form. I'm turning into short form. It fit perfect in, tic in TikTok. TikTok, even the other day, I saw this article and this, this may put me over the edge. I'm not sure. But they're starting to get into podcasting and they're going to start doing some unique stuff with podcasts, which if they actually do that and they can drive some traffic, it may be worth saying, hey, like my show just needs a, a little bit, of, it needs a new space with that. We're speaking to a broad audience. Let's go see if we can, right. get, you know, get some traction in this space. And we also saw Facebook get into a Twitter competitor. They were, they went gangbusters for a couple of days and now it's a ghost town. So yeah, we'll see if they can actually perform in that space and actually take any market share from the big guys, Spotify, Apple, YouTube, and see if they can actually put a dent in any of that. But TikTok is interesting to me. YouTube, I agree. Every, everybody I'm talking to, all my the clients I'm talking to or people I'm talking to or consulting with, they they just don't, I don't think people realize how big a deal YouTube is. And it's growing mm -hmm. insanely. Just in the my the data on my the last two weeks for me starting this thing and posting and trying to kind of be devoted to YouTube for a period of time is just showing how much potential there really is there in that space and how to how to multiply reach as a result of taking long form content putting turning it into short shorts on YouTube putting putting um, even some of my long form stuff which uh, in the past my podcasts have gone maybe a handful of views on a long form podcast or one of them somehow got into a feed and got a couple, couple hundred view, 175 views or something like that, which is way more than your typical hour long, hour and a half long podcast is going to get right. somebody that's just starting out like me. So it's really, really interesting. And then I have shorts that will get three views. And then I have shorts that get that one of them got 2,700 views. So we're just figuring it out, but YouTube has just incredible potential. It really does. It really does. The key is, is to keep creating content because every time you create something, put it out there, you get better at creating. Uh, and and it, it, it's a blessing if people find you early on when you're not as good and they love you and they stick with you. Um, all those reps that we need to actually get good at what we want to do and what we want to create, 
by the time that's our goal, right? So by the time that people really want to, you know, start finding us, we want to be good. Like we want to be, you know, delivering you know, the goods and, and you only get there by, by practice. What about just really quick? And then we'll move on last to like leadership and influence and what you've learned in your experience managing money and how that influences people. What about AI? You guys using AI for anything in your, in your business? And how, how do you nah. think about it? Uh, what do I think about it? I don't. Just to be honest, I don't think about it. Uh, you know, that's probably not the right answer. I say it this way. And let me try to say this the, carefully. I'm going to have a lot of hedging comments in here. But I think that AI has significant potential. I think this bom- initial wave that bombarded everybody like AI is going to take over the world and take your job and do all of that. I, I'm I'm kind of skeptical on that. That's me personally. You've got a lot of people that, that um, have the, have the time and the interest to go on to those different platforms and, and prompt them. And, you know, several, I, I remember seeing several things where chat GPT was being prompted and it was, it was showing clear bias um, in some of the answers that was given based on how it was prompted. And, and, and so here's what I would go back to you and say, like anything that's created is going to have fingerprints of the creator in it. I believe we are created beings. I believe God created human beings. There are fingerprints of God's creation are all around us and in us. Whether we choose to acknowledge that or not, that is what he allows. He allows us to have the free will to, you know, accept or reject. Any technology program, anything that's written or created, it's going to have the fingerprints of whoever's creating it. Um, and so I, I just say, you know, take there there are going to be things that are going to be phenomenal that that improve people's lives. Um, but we always have to have a healthy dose of skepticism and say, okay, well, how much of my personal information do I want to give AI access to? How much of my pictures and data and of course because we all live in the cloud and online a lot of that data is probably already available you know and so who knows what's going to come out so i remember with us specifically in my industry because we are regulated and we we client confidentiality is up there with everybody they said hey look be very careful with how you leverage ai in your practice because some of the stuff the security measures haven't been tested yet so they're going to be people that are banking client information and notes and and, and plans and, and investment thoughts and processes using AI. And if these, if these servers are attacked and, and people steal their data, what could they possibly get? So a healthy dose of skepticism for me. Um, I do think there's going to be some really neat things that come from it. So I'm curious to see, but I, I'm not going to be on the early adoption wave when it comes to AI. That's That's interesting. I like it. Let's move into leadership and influence really quick. And we'll close out with this, just this, this question. So as you manage money, how, how does that impacted folks influence? When I think leadership is influence, we follow a savior that was the most influential person that's ever walked the earth. And he's kind of the Jesus mm-hmm. example for leadership and influence for me because he was the most influential person that's ever walked the planet. So you learn some, you learn skills from knowing what he did as a person on the earth that made him so influential. How do you, how do you, what have you learned as you've seen influence play out in the money space that is really impactful? If that makes sense. Um, what have I learned? I've peppered in some of this thing. One of the things that I would say is you know, there's this idea, um, this concept of more, like if we just get more, like we're going to be happier. And, and and I don't believe that, you know, I believe that, yes, there, there's, there's some research that even will back up, you know, like there's, as we get to certain income levels, and certain asset levels, as far as wealth accumulation, like our degree of satisfaction with each new level upward starts to plateau. Um, it doesn't completely plateau. Obviously, I don't think anyone that says, hey, we're financially independent is going to be be sad about that. But um, 
you look at a lot of celebrities and you look at a lot of wealthy people and a lot of them are unhappy. Um, they have, you know, drug problems or they've struggled with anxiety, depression, or they're divorced, divorced, divorced multiple times, have terrible relationships with their kids. Um, but financially they are doing exponentially better than your average person. And I think that's a clear cut example of the idea that just more, more stuff, more money, more income doesn't mean you're going to have um, exceedingly and abundantly life to the full. That's not what that means. Um, so that's something that I've, I've learned. And I've learned that um, having what your worldview, t your worldview and how rooted you are in that directs the, you know, your life decisions. Um, in so many ways, even ways that we're not consciously aware of. And that's one of the things that is so difficult to really help people understand is that we all have subconscious biases and subconscious wiring that directs us um, that we're not even aware of a lot of times. You know, that's why it's subconscious. And so there's 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 so many things like psychologically that are fascinating when it comes to how people interact with money and wealth. Um, it's infinitely more complex than you would think um, it is. And, you know, I think that, that that is a huge unexplored space for for a lot of people, because, you know, a lot of people just think, oh, if I have two things and I get two more things, now I have four and four is better than two. And that's where most people are on that trajectory of understanding, you know, accumulating wealth. But it's so much more complex than that. There's relationship, you know, complexity. There's psychological. There's personal biases. There's trauma, individual trauma that you may have um, in some, you know, some families. So it's 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 a such a world where, as an advisor, I love being able to try to help people with like real wisdom and help them uncover some of the things and help them learn about themselves. One of the things they say is, um, in. in the research in the people that I, I look at for this is like, we aren't the heroes. Clients are the heroes and they are the experts on themselves. And so part of our job is to help them uncover that. And, and part of that hero's journey is to be a guide. And that's what we want to do for folks. Michael, thanks man for taking the time to spend an hour talking about your life and your business and, and what you're seeing in the market. Yeah, dude. Really appreciate it. 